The Peace Beyond by Ajahn Chah If we look according to reality, without trying to sugar things over, we'll see that it's really pitiful and wearisome. Dispassion will arise. This feeling of disinterest is not that we feel aversion for the world or anything. It's simply our mind clearing up, our mind letting go. We see things as not substantial or dependable but that all things are naturally established just as they are. However we want them to be, they just go their own way regardless. Whether we laugh or cry, they simply are the way they are. Things which are unstable are unstable. Things which are not beautiful are not beautiful. So the Buddha said that when we experience sights, sounds, tastes, smells, bodily feelings or mental states, we should release them. When the ear hears sounds, let them go. When the nose smells an odour, let it go. Just leave it at the nose. When bodily feelings arise, let go of the like or dislike that follow. Let them go back to their birthplace. The same for mental states. All these things, just let them go their way. This is knowing. Whether it's happiness or unhappiness, it's all the same. This is called meditation. Meditation means to make the mind peaceful in order to let wisdom arise. This requires that we practice with body and mind in order to see and know the sense impression of form, sound, taste, smell, touch and mental formations.
To put it simply, it's just a matter of happiness and unhappiness. Happiness is pleasant feeling in the mind. Unhappiness is just unpleasant feeling. The Buddha taught to separate this happiness and unhappiness from the mind. The mind is that which knows. Feeling is the characteristic of happiness or unhappiness. Like or dislike. When the mind indulges in these things, we say that it clings to or takes that happiness and unhappiness to be worthy of holding. That clinging is an action of mind. That happiness or unhappiness is feeling. When we say the Buddha told us to separate the mind from the feeling, he didn't literally mean to throw them to different places. He meant that the mind must know happiness and know unhappiness. When sitting in samadhi, for example, and peace fills the mind, then happiness comes, but it doesn't reach us. Unhappiness comes, but doesn't reach us. This is to separate the feeling from the mind. We can compare it to oil and water in a bottle. They don't combine. Even if you try to mix them, the oil remains oil and the water remains water because they are of different density. The natural state of the mind is neither happiness nor unhappiness. When feeling enters the mind, then happiness or unhappiness is born. If we have mindfulness, then we know pleasant feeling as pleasant feeling. The mind which knows will not pick it up. Happiness is there, but it's outside the mind, not buried within the mind. The mind simply knows it clearly.
if we separate unhappiness from the mind, does that mean there is no suffering, that we don't experience it? Yes, we experience it, but we know mind as mind, feeling as feeling. We don't cling to that feeling or carry it around. The Buddha separated these things through knowledge and wisdom. Did he have suffering? He knew the state of suffering, but he didn't cling to it. So we say that he cut suffering off. And there was happiness too, but he knew that happiness. For if it's not known, it is like a poison. He didn't hold it to be himself. Happiness was there through knowledge, but it didn't exist in his mind. Thus we say that he separated happiness and unhappiness from his mind. When we say that the Buddha and the Enlightened Ones killed defilements, it's not that they really killed them. If they had killed all defilements, then we probably wouldn't have any. They didn't kill defilements when they knew them for what they are, they let them go. Someone who's stupid will grab them. But the enlightened ones knew the defilements in their own minds as a poison. So they swept them out. They swept out the things which caused them to suffer. They didn't kill them. One who doesn't know this will see some things, such as happiness, as good, and then grab them. But the Buddha just knew them and simply brush them away. But when feeling arises for us, we indulge in it. That is, the mind carries that happiness and unhappiness around. In fact, they are two different things. 
the activities of mind, pleasant feeling, unpleasant feeling, and so on, are mental impressions. They are the world. If the mind knows this, it can equally do work involving happiness or unhappiness. Why? Because it knows the truth of these things. Someone who doesn't know them sees them as having different value. But one who truly knows them sees them as equal. If you cling to happiness, it will be the birthplace of unhappiness later on. Because happiness is unstable, it changes all the time. When happiness disappears, unhappiness arises. The Buddha knew that because both happiness and unhappiness are unsatisfactory, they have the same value. When happiness arose, he let it go. He had right practice, seeing that both these things have equal values and drawbacks. They come under the law of Dharma. That is, they are unstable and unsatisfactory. Once born, they die. When he saw this, right view arose. The right way of practice became clear. No matter what sort of feeling or thinking arose in his mind, he knew it as simply the continuous play of happiness and unhappiness. He didn't cling to them. So we say that a meditator should not walk the way of happiness or unhappiness. Rather, they should know them. Knowing the truth of suffering, they will know the cause of suffering, the end of suffering, and the way leading to the end of suffering. And the way out of suffering 
is meditation itself. To put it simply, we must be mindful. Mindfulness is knowing or presence of mind. Right now, what are we thinking? What are we doing? What do we have with us right now? We observe like this. We are aware of how we are living. Practicing like this, wisdom can arise. We consider and investigate at all times, in all postures. When a mental impression arises that we like, we know it as such but we don't hold it to be anything substantial. It's just happiness. When unhappiness arises, we know that it's indulgence in pain. It's not the path of a meditator. This is what we call separating the mind from the feeling. If we are clever, we don't attach. We leave things be. We become the one who knows. The mind and feeling are just like oil and water. They are in the same bottle, but they don't mix. If we are sick or in pain, we still know the feeling is feeling. The mind is mind. We know the painful or comfortable states, but we don't identify with them. 
we stay only with peace. Peace beyond both comfort and pain. You should understand it like this, because if there is no permanent self, then there is no refuge. You must live like this, that is, without happiness and without unhappiness. You stay only with the knowing. You don't carry things around. So long as we are still unenlightened, all this may sound strange, but it doesn't matter. We just set our goal in this direction. The mind is the mind. It meets happiness and unhappiness, and we see them as merely that. There's nothing more to it. They are divided, not mixed. If they are all mixed up, then we don't know them. It's like living in a house. The house and its occupant are related but separate. If there is danger in our house, we are distressed because we must protect it. But if the house catches fire, we get out of it. If painful feelings arise, we get out of it, just like that house. When it's full of fire, and we know it, we come running out of it. They are separate things. The house is one thing. The occupant is another. We say that we separate mind and feeling in this way. But in fact, they are by nature already separate. Our realization 
is simply to know this natural separateness according to reality. When we say they are not separated, it's because we're clinging to them through ignorance of the truth. So the Buddha told us to meditate. This practice of meditation is very important. Merely to know with the intellect is not enough. The knowledge which arises from practice with a peaceful mind and the knowledge which comes from study are really far apart. The knowledge which comes from study is not real knowledge of our mind. If we really know, then there's letting go, leaving things be. We know how things are and don't forget ourselves. If it happens that we are sick, we don't get lost in that. Someone who's sick or dying should be really diligent in their practice. One may say they don't have time to meditate. They're sick. They're suffering. They don't trust their body. And so they feel that they can't meditate. If we think like this, and things are difficult. The Buddha didn't teach like that. He said that right here is the place to meditate. When we're sick or almost dying, that's when we can really know and see reality. This practice is just about the mind and its feelings. It's not something that you have to run after or struggle for. Nature takes care of the natural processes. All we have to do is try to be aware. just to keep trying, going inwards 
to see clearly. Meditation is like this. If we investigate like this continuously, the mind will find release. But it's not escaping through ignorance. The mind lets go, but it knows. It doesn't let go through stupidity. Not because it doesn't want things to be the way they are. It lets go because it knows according to the truth. This is seeing nature. The reality that's all around us. We practice in order to let go of both right and wrong. In the end, we just throw everything out. If it's right, throw it out. Wrong, throw it out. Usually if it's right, we cling to rightness. If it's wrong, we hold it to be wrong, and then arguments follow. But the Dharma is the place where there's nothing, nothing at all.